way you get uh, one editor uh, who's uh, you trust and whose uh, instructions you you feel you can adopt into your into your piece, um, and uh, rather than getting a deluge of, of different uh, uh, that you know whether it's peers or or, uh, or different writers of different levels that are coming back at you, uh, it can get a little bit confusing. Now, just to clarify again, we are speaking right now of, of course, fiction writing. Um, I know we were talking about journalistic, um, you know, writing before, but uh, what we're discussing now is mainly fiction writing. You know, about writing at a high level and uh, getting feedback um, for your writing. Now, you, yeah. the third thing that uh, I wanted to ask from that um, that last bit that you were telling us about was you. Did mention writing every day, which is a very key thing. Um, do you ever get writer's block, and uh, if so, how do you deal with it? Mm. Sorry to put you know, in the I, spot. I, I, I always, yeah. I mean, I, I think writer's block is a bit of a fallacy. You know, I, I really think it's just uh, yeah, yeah. Sure, you write yourself into corners sometimes when you're um, uh, when you're producing work, but uh, I think it's just. Uh, you have to force yourself. You know, I think it's like with any any uh, line of work, you you have to go to work every day. Uh, you have to make sure you do it. You may not feel like it, but you have to uh, to, to work through it. Uh, a lot of times, writer's block. I think is just writers have hit a point in their story that they're working on where they're not quite sure how to um, advance it either in terms of plot or character, and, and a lot of times that means going back and, and uh, editing and, and finding the spot where you made, made a wrong turn and, and, and fixing it. So, um, you know, it's uh, the, yeah, writer's block, whenever you do that, you should. Uh, it's a hint that you should be uh, going back and editing uh, and finding out where, where things um, uh, kind of stopped or went off the tracks and then uh, get yourself back on track. Now, from personal experience, I do kind of agree with you a little bit. Uh, actually, a lot. I do agree with you a lot because, like, um, when I was actively writing, um, I took it like it was a job. Like, I always had the same routine. I, you know, get up and do the same thing. I go to the same place to do my writing. And, uh, yeah, I have to say that um, that's the mentality you have to have is to kind of, like, treat it as is a job that you have it, you, you have to show up for work and you have to uh, get you know this done so I, I find that to be uh, you know very very helpful uh, when I was writing like uh, regularly um, yeah. yeah so that's great uh, the next thing to touch on is again something that was mentioned earlier again about fiction writing now my understanding from what you were discussing earlier was about introducing a character so if I understood correctly from what you were referring to before if I were to introduce a character in fiction I have to kind of like make the first few sentences important and crucial so that uh, the reader understands like, why this character is, is, is there yeah, you, you know, I think uh, yeah, it's always good to you know look at some of the the great writers and every great piece of fiction and, and how they uh, started. You know, the great the great Gatsby. I remember it starts with uh, Nick Carraway, who's the narrator of the the novel, speaking in first person, and uh, the, the opening line is about um, uh, his uncle, he and his uncle on a boat, and. Uh, and how there's uh, a lack of pretense in, in that uh, relationship, and, and it, then it goes into the introduction of, uh, of Jay Gatsby and Daisy and, and, and the other characters. But you know, by introducing uh, Nick Carraway right away at uh, the beginning, there it's, uh, it shows that he's one the observer. Um, he's not the main focus of the story. It's, uh, it's going to be his observations that are going to lead you to that tale of, you know, great, uh, uh, great destruction of of, um, uh, of that character, uh, the, the, the great Gatsby, and uh, you know, also in uh, Farewell to Arms, Ernest Hemingway's book, it uh, uh, starts off with uh, the the lieutenant uh, in the uh, in the war uh, uh, telling his uh, his idyllic uh, beginnings. Uh, um, of what he remembered from home, and that that uh, contrasts what happens in the story and all of the, the, the turmoil of living through a war experience. So, it, you, you know, the the beginning of a fiction is going to impact 
you know, talk about your character, but also talk about um, the the scope of the book and and, and the uh, the importance of uh, a place in it too. So, you know, there's there's so much that goes on in in terms of how to uh, structure a novel or how to, how to structure a short story. But you, you know, by beginning with with a person right away, you're you're really focusing it on on their story. Uh, and that goes with fiction too, or sorry, it goes with journalism too. It's like if you focus on on one person right away, uh, it actually makes it a little bit easier to, to to streamline the rest of the book because you can always go back to when you're asking yourself what's the story about. Then you know you've got that character to tell you, help you, uh, direct you uh, in that way. We're speaking with Adrian Birch Bassey here on Smitten by the Wind on CJSF 90.1 FM. Uh, getting back to, I guess, I want to call it pitfalls of writing. Um, earlier you were discussing how grammar is a, a thing that uh, people stumble on uh, quite a bit. Uh, are there any other pitfalls that, um, that writers should be aware of? Yeah, you know, well, uh, maybe not a... Yeah, I guess you could call it a pitfall. I think, you know, the, the urge to... Not do things that uh, that might be difficult. You know, the uh, the uh, I'm reluctant to call it laziness. I don't want to call it that, but you know, I think <laughs> the, the, the you, you, you there are moments in when you're writing fiction where uh, the opportunity to escalate a conflict or to write a conflict into the story um, presents itself, and a lot of times I think writers will shy away from that because. When you enter a conflict, you have to resolve the conflict, and that can take a lot of effort uh, from a writing standpoint. But uh, there are times when, and there's a lot of times, I think more times than not, when the, that, that opportunity is there, and you really you have to take it. You have to. Um, it's really how you move move uh, uh, stories along is uh, through conflict and resolution of that conflict, and, and characters overcoming obstacles throughout throughout a novel. So. Um, uh, I think that's that's when, when you're talking about a writer who's maybe uh, looking to get to the highest level and maybe not just get, getting there yet. I think that's one thing I, I see a lot is that uh, um, the the not going there part of uh, writing. You know, when, when as a reader and as an editor, I want the writer to go in that direction where they have to deal with. The issues that they kind of bring up in in their piece, but um, you know that that's one thing. That's a, that's a little more complex, maybe than <laughs> that's definitely more complex than the basic elements, I guess, that we're supposed to be uh, discussing now. But uh, the, that's um, one aspect. Another, I think, another pitfall is just uh, uh, the tenses. I see a lot of times people go back and forth between past and present tense. Um, I see. Uh, a character development where they don't um, characters don't stick uh, true to uh, them, I guess themselves in terms of what we've learned about them over the first X number of pages. Then all of a sudden they do something completely out of character, and as a reader, you're not prepared for it, so it's it's jarring. Uh, use of uh, cliches often, uh, uh, re- repetition of nouns, and and uh, and verbs in close proximity to each other, which, you know, that's just a, more of a uh, something that during the editing process you want to polish for sure. Um, and, you know, just the not editing enough, too. I think that's uh, that's another thing I see is that uh, it, people don't go go over things as often as, um, as uh, they probably should, I think. So with some of those pitfalls, again, that's where, uh, like, a second pair of eyes would uh, help immensely just because... Absolutely. Okay, I see. Now, um, w- I guess to get back to one of the pitfalls uh, from earlier, uh, well, actually, the first one you mentioned, uh, the last bit, was, you know, taking a lot of effort to resolve a conflict so that, uh, so much so that writers shy away from it. Now, mm-hmm. th- that's that's where... You're talking about like writing a short story, is that right? Because it affects a number of words and it affects like um, you know how quickly the story moves along. Is that what you're referring to? Um, or are you talking? Uh, yeah, 
Well, I mean, there's short stories. I mean, I'm, in fiction in general, you know, and, and there's short story uh, that you shouldn't have a set leg until there's a short story before you write it, I don't think. I think you, you write the story to uh, from beginning to end, and the story kind of dictates where, where that end is um, uh, in, in terms of all the uh, things that you put into it from the beginning. It can be just a scene. Uh, a scene of 500 words can have conflict and resolution uh, and be complete. Um, but you know what? What I'm talking more about is uh, uh, you put a co- put a character at the crossroads, and uh, you know the, you have to make them pick a choice. They can't just uh, uh, er, turn turn around, or you you put them at a crossroads, and one side looks like it's an easy path, but the, you, on the other side it looks like a very rough road. You can't just have them take the easy path. The reader wants you to wants to know what's on that uh, what's on that other side. Yeah. Um, that, that sort of that sort of thing, which is probably a bit of an esoteric answer, but uh, uh, hopefully you, you can follow. So that that's a great point. Yeah, just because now that you mentioned that, I do see what you mean in terms of um, you know putting a lot of effort into uh, trying to resolve that conflict. That's okay. Um, the other thing as well with the the pitfalls. Is, is I guess it was with character sorry, with characters um, how they don't develop uh, or how you know, the reader doesn't see enough development in in the characters I, I guess is uh, a better sure. way to uh, put it. Um, You're right. H- how can we overcome that? Yeah, you know, maybe I can uh, expand a little bit on that conflict issue and answer this at the same time. I'm editing a kind of a new writer's work right now where she's. Uh, talking about uh, a childhood experience with her parents on a camping trip and she alludes that there's tension in the relationship between the mother and the father um, but uh, it's all very much stays on the surface the, the, it doesn't get into the uh, she says things like mom and dad are yelling at each other at home but out here in camping they're, they're in peace Like the, the, those sort of lines that are telling but they're not showing what what I would want to do uh, both from a character development point and also from a plot development point is have that character show um, what she's observing of her parents' interaction, what the di- differences are at home, how does that make that child feel um, to be in this wide open space where uh, there is freedom um, it w- uh, 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 you know that's one of those things um, where you, a place can also impact character. A place or setting in the story can impact character. You've got someone who feels conflict uh, in a home, but in an open space that it isn't there. It's sort of embellishing on those things that you've already got in there in that story, but you need to delve deeper uh, to bring it all out, um, bring out all of the, uh, the the. The topics or the themes that you touch on it, that, or that you introduce into the story, and, and just kind of uh, make sure they're all uh, dealt with um, uh, in your work. Okay. And um, now a few more things to to go over in terms of. Uh, I, I know we kind of evolved a little bit from, or we kind of deviate a, a little bit from the original topic here, but getting back to basic elements of craft. Now, um, I believe it was kind of slightly mentioned just a few moments ago, uh, just a little bit, but uh, it, it's to do with how you mentioned you should just write from the beginning to the end. If, if I understood correctly. Now, what about uh, working off of outlines? Like, um, should a writer be working off of an outline when they're trying to write, like, uh, mm-hmm. like a manuscript? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I think every you, you, everyone has a different way of getting to the same uh, point. Uh, you know, I wouldn't uh, tell anyone to do things one way or another. It's what, what you feel most comfortable with. I think some people want to outline each uh, chapter of a book before they sit down and and uh, write it. Uh, some people want to write um, uh, outlines for the characters and who they are and kind of answer almost biographical questions about who, who these people are before they um, flesh them out in, into a full narrative. Uh, you know, personally, I my. I, when I write uh, fiction, I write. Uh, I get a burst of inspiration. I write from the beginning until 
that inspiration runs out, uh, which usually means of, uh, like I said, I, I, I put myself into a corner somehow. That's exactly what I was going to say. I pointed myself yeah. to a corner before when I was trying to work off an outline because I the whole chapter twenty six has to have has to have this happen, and I kind of paint myself into a corner there. So I definitely right. understand what you're talking about there. But uh, sorry, uh, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you there. Oh yeah, yeah, no, exactly. You know, you you write to, to a point where you know you thought when you got to the to the end or where you thought it might be the end. Uh, actually isn't or does, there there isn't a a way to do it that, that uh, makes any sense in terms of plot or character so you have to go back and, and revise and edit and, and kind of fix those uh, uh, imperfect stitches I guess in, in, in the tapestry that's your manuscript so. and uh, another uh, important question when dealing with basic elements of crab I think is uh, um, how do you find the elusive writer's voice? But I think you kind of touched on that a little bit. Uh, would you like to mm-hmm. recap uh, that a little bit? Yeah, you know, I mean, when whatever someone's saying, what, what your vo- what's your writer's voice? It, it, it's just your style. It's a, everyone has their own personal style of, of writing. It's uh, uh, and you want to be able to figure what that is out as quickly as you possibly can in your writing career. You know, the, the sooner you know what your writing style is, the the better you can start perfecting it and uh i like i said i always think your writing style is very uh, close to the type of reading that you um uh, like to do so you know if you like uh, uh lit books <laughs> or if you like uh, uh very I- intense uh, novels uh, uh or sorry um, if you like books uh, very uh Book a prize winning novels, very high literature like uh, Margaret Atwood's books or Macklin Dodge's books, then uh, it, it, you know that you're uh, compelled to be uh, 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 writing great literature. You know, that's that's what you really want to do. And uh, uh, it's uh, being able to understand what uh, why you write the way you do is, is really important to establishing yourself um, as a. Uh, establishing your voice for sure so it depends on your own style of writing as well as like a type of book you're writing as well pretty much yeah you know you you can uh even, you know but even if you have writers who are going through the multi genres it's still that that voice that style is still the same you know that doesn't change um uh it, and if you do t- try to change it you're only you know weakening uh, whatever piece of work you're working on because um it, it's the, that style is what's uh uh what is mo- most natural to you and it's uh, it's the the ability to uh, what what you're able to uh, write uh, at the highest level with so it's uh if you're writing a children's book and if you're writing uh public relations piece or if you're writing a piece of journalism your your style is still going to be um relevant in in all of those uh, pieces so it's important to to figure out uh, what that writer's voice or writer's style is for for uh for yourself and uh, when we were talking off the off air earlier about research, uh so I want to bring that into the conversation now uh, when you're talking about research well, um, are you referring to what we discussed earlier in terms of um, trying to figure out how successful writers have, have used um, foreshadowing or other elements into their work, or are you referring to a different type of research that writers should be aware of? Yeah, well, I think it's uh, the research to get the, get your um, plots and your characters uh uh, as accurate as they can be to uh, the real life uh, situations that you're you're dealing with, I think that's the most important type of research for for a fiction writer. Um, obviously, for a journalist, uh, the research is uh, the, everything. Really, it's uh, to, to be factual. But uh, you know, with, with fiction, um, the uh, the research you're doing is to make sure your uh, characters and the plot situations are are accurate to real life. Um, and uh, yeah, but also did, looking at um, you know gaining the knowledge of uh, what the other writers have done with their their work and uh, and how they develop their uh, characters and plots and and deconstructing uh, them. 
Okay. And um, you mentioned a little bit about, um, you know, routines that a writer should uh, have, you know, earlier when we, were ha- when we were discussing this. Now, what other practices or routines should you adopt, you know, if you are an, an experienced writer? <laughs> well, uh, you know, writing between writing every day, reading every day, and uh, making sure you, you put your work out there to get the, some uh, feedback. Uh, okay. Uh, All right. I, I think th- those are the three main things. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, you know, I think uh, making sure you, you you write every day is the, is the most important thing, especially if you're starting out. You know, you have to get that routine. All right. That's fantastic. Um, uh, are there any other uh, things that we haven't covered, uh, do you think, in terms of uh, basic elements of craft, uh, Adrian? Oh, I'm, I'm sure we, there's, a, there's a whole lot to it. But, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, the most important thing is, you, you know, you write because you're passionate about writing. So, you, you know, just uh, stay true to that part of it and, uh, and don't get discouraged and understand that, um, you know, the constructive criticism is most important in, in this uh, field um, as uh, maybe anything else uh, that, uh, you know, it's uh, you want uh, when you're getting feedback, when you're getting an editor looking at your work, it's um, you, you want to be make sure that uh, you're getting that from someone who really understands uh, your work and what you're trying to put out there and is going to be conscientious to that. Uh, you used to offer tips on writing on um, on your website. Uh, what was happened uh, with that? I've gotten pretty busy to keep to keep that uh, keep up. For, well, really, my own blog is uh, I haven't uh, updated it nearly as much as I used to. But yes, I do have writing tips on there um, uh, uh, from a while back, and I will. Uh, I do have every intention of having more <laughs> at some point. But you do write every day. Uh, oh yes, yes, and, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and, you know, probably too much, but uh, I do. And um, but you know, the, uh, our previous conversations, I, I've got uh, got them up on my site or, or will, uh, and uh, we've had our other discussions about craft and, and other things uh, on there that uh, people can refer to if they want more tips. All right, uh, this is a perfect time now for you to um, to introduce or to reintroduce uh, your novel in progress, Triumph the Lion. I understand you um, are going to read out the, the final parts of Chapter 2. Is that right, Adrian? Yeah, I th- you know, when we last spoke, we uh, it uh, was in the middle of Chapter 2 um, in terms of what I read, and uh, now we can kind of pick it up and finish with the rest. All right, if you're ready, um, we'll go ahead. Sure, and uh, this picks up, uh, it's uh, stories about uh, safari in Africa, and uh, it, it has to do with a particular lion. That, uh, and in this scene that I read, we're about to meet the lion. Uh, and uh, this uh, part here is um, uh, we pick it up in the middle of a stampede of wildebeests going across uh, the South African um, safari, the South African Kruger Park. There, uh, look at them all! A woman in the back shouted. Up, uh, in the back of the Land Rover shouted keeping a hand on her hat as Sham pushed the vehicle to keep pace with the dozens and do- dozens of wildebeests scampering across the wild. The safari passengers snapped and snapped, clicking shutters with the speed of a gray finch's beak that has caught up to a worm. Sham pulled the Land Rover next to the animals and slowed a bit for the photographers. He didn't keep his foot off the accelerator long, though. Soon he raced toward the front. The herd clomped along, kicking up Kruger dust. Stuff so moving, humans who visit take vows of it home, and crushing grass that had turned yellowish like straw. The lodge's guests kept photographing, an orgy of digital capture as they laughed giddily between whoops of amazement. Sham, too, chortled at the scene, and my head hurt from the booze the night before and the unending thought I needed to find out how fast a wildebeest could sprint. I needed to gauge what it would take to keep up with one of them, and the best way to do so was to leap off the tracker seat, flee from from the Land Rover, and run with the gnus. I nearly turned over on my ankle when I landed, stumbling to regain my footing after losing my balance. The initial speed with which I hit the ground nearly caused me to fall. Once steady, I scampered alongside one of the beasts, close enough to touch its flesh, its coarse hair 
feeling the pounding of its heartbeat against its chest. It looked at me with one black eye, with one with an eye black as charred wood, gaped its nostrils, and ran on. I put my ha- head down and raced to keep up. In my ears, the rollicking din of the stampede was broken only intermittently by the boom of Sham's voice, screaming my name. Get in the jeep. Get in the jeep, Blue. Now. The GNU I touched was gone in seconds, followed by the one behind it and the 150 or so more behind that one. They jetted away from me in a race at some finish line I would never see. When they were gone, dirt clouded the landscape as it flowed in the hearse wake. I surrendered at last and laughed when I stopped. Bent over at the knees, I panted and said woo and caught, coughed out some more laughter and the taste of the chalky dirt stayed on my tongue. In the distance, another cloud rose as impalas massed together and fled for safety. You're a madman, you know that? Sham squeaked the Land Rover to a stop and slammed the door as he hurried to me. You got a death wish or something, he asked me. I ran out of breath, I said. He slapped me in the back of the head and grabbed my collar to drag me from the field. Bloody idiot, one of the male passengers, an Aussie it sounded like, said as Sham shoved me back into the front seat next to him, ending my days as his tracker. After we were on course again, he turned to me and said, You have not got a death wish. He hit me with the Madluli death stare for the first time. Know how I know? I didn't respond, making sure to avoid glancing at his angry, supernatural-looking eyes. You got back in the jeep, he said. Sure I did, I answered under my, responded under my breath staring at the vacant tracker seat in front of me. I was too ashamed by what I'd done to look at anyone, too focused on scouting the plains. Beautiful that day, ginger brown and auriferous under the sun, calm in the heat, whose intensity steadily grew like the temperature of a calabash of water, building to a boil. While staring off, I spotted a leopard climbing a tree. As I wondered what might have spooked it to claw up the trunk, I peered in every clump of forest and patch of shrubbery, hopeful for a golden maid and redolent eyes of fire I was sure lurked about. Damn fool, Sham said. I can't even say you're a stupid white man because you aren't one, but you act like it, act it, let me tell you. Maybe you grow up in Canada and you turn white, is that it? Can't help but act like some one of some of those old fool good old boys come here from Atlanta and Houston and rent big-ass elephant guns and think they're going to be in lawless Africa. So, of course, they can shoot off something other than the pixels in the camera. You just that stupid? Sorry, man, I got carried away, I said. You want to do crazy shit and get yourself killed? Fine. You're so obsessed with this lucky line of yours you want to lose your life before it gets itself killed? Fine. You do it. You just do it on some other poor Madluli's time. I'll buy you a drink, I told him. You'll buy me the, the bottle and you'll pour each damn glass for me. An instant later, Selrock sidled out from beneath a thicket of brush and weeds. Sham shut up. I grinned. I didn't need to be in the tracker's post to locate the animal every one of our passengers wanted most to see. Sham crunched on the brakes, jolting the Tavish Killies guests up against the black steel bars that separated the rows of seats in the Land Rover. My neck whiplashed, and when it smacked against the headrest, I looked again and saw the lion. I knew it, I thought. I knew you were here. And he hasn't been the same since, Shamrock said to Maria, back at the lodge, uh, as we were drinking our scotch. Why, she asked. What is it about this lion? Sham and I were silent, conspiratorial in our drinking. The overhead fan wasped. Corn crickets continued to gossip in a blistering buzz outside, and Maria got cranky as the seconds clocked down on her first day in Africa. You two have really got me curious, you and everyone else. Someone has to tell me. She fought a, a yawn but lost. Her mouth widened, revealing perfect white teeth and a tongue that was curling up to the roof of her mouth as if to veil the back of her throat. The alcohol and the fatigue of the journey to reach the Tavish Gilly had gotten to her at last. Is seeing this thing going to make me religious? I can't promise you'll see any animal, Sham mumbled as he glanced out the window in the direction of the insect chirps. Some think he's hideous, I told her. Some think he's the most beautiful thing they've ever looked at. 
Those words didn't stir her. She covered her open mouth with the back of her hand. Her fingernails danced wildly as if she were a puppeteer struggling to get her lips to close. Everyone has to decide for themselves. Sham, I finished my drink and again played with the necklace of water beads that shimmered on the table. 